they're bringing low inventory level, which I think that's going to be the, one of the biggest problem because now they're charging you for a product that you don't keep in the Amazon marketplace. Basically, you need to keep an average of product that you used to sell. All right. Hello, I'm your host, Ben, and welcome back to another episode of Season 2 of the Amazon Strategist Show, the show that is all strategy with no hacks, no silver bullets, and no magic pills, just real practical strategy for serious Amazon sellers. All right. I just wrapped up an awesome episode with Barack from Forsket. We talked about all things logistics, shipping, how you can actually optimize those parts of your Amazon and e-commerce business to boost your bottom line. And we also talked about some really important fee changes that have just been announced on Amazon that are going to impact a lot of sellers in the new year. So in 2024. So make sure you're paying attention. Watch this one all the way through. Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. So today we have the pleasure of being joined by the incredible Barack. Leveraging his experience in the Amazon space, he started an freight forwarder and supply chain and logistics company, Forsket, in Miami in 2020, which I can imagine would be a pretty crazy time to get something like that going. So we're going to dive into that today. But Forsket offers an innovative platform that helps customers optimize their logistics processes and make their overall the industry more efficient. Under his leadership, the company's tripled in size. Wow, that's impressive. In the past two years by expanding its customer and partner network. Thank you. Welcome to the show, Barack. Uh, we appreciate you coming on today and taking the time. And I think you, now you guys are headquartered in Miami, but you've also got operations in China, Turkey, Colombia. Where else? I know you were mentioning you have some uh, late and early calls right before we got started. So we also have our own 3PL in Los Angeles. You know, uh, 40% of the import to the United United States, it's going through Long Beach and Los Angeles port. So it's a very important distribution center. Majority of Amazon FBA centers and now AWD, you know, uh, Amazon warehouse distribution centers are in California. So it's a very important place for brands to, you know, expand, fulfill. Like we have a location there and now we also have a sales team in Chicago. So we're expanding. That's awesome. Just to kind of take it back to kind of the start. So before you started Forsket, how did you actually kind of get into this whole e-commerce or Amazon world? If you could kind of run through that for us real quick. Um, you know, I finished my bachelor's degree in, in Istanbul, Turkey. Then I did my MBA in Paris, France. And that's the time um, I, I kind of knew that I wanted to have international background, international experience. So then I decided to uh, do a six months internship in China. So I decided to move to China in 2012. That, back then, you know, we didn't have really smartphones and stuff. Uh, and China had really good economy, a uh, lot of opportunities, a lot of expats. They moved there. And I, my original plan was staying there for six months, but then I ended up staying like seven years. And I started my sourcing business there. And then, yeah, it, it, it was like one of the best. I think it was like a lifetime experience. I'm very happy I did that because the knowledge, the experience, you know, there are two things you can actually buy in the life that one is experience and another is time. So for me, I, I kind of had both of them there. And then I was young, I had nothing to lose. So I kind of started a small sourcing company. I was doing a quality insurance, quality checks in the factories, travel all around China, Asia. It was the best time of my life. No responsibilities, you know, no money, but no responsibilities also uh, back <laughs> yeah. then. But, but it was a good experience, you know, and then I started the B2B business in, in China. I, I exported a lot of different products to worldwide. And then my clients asked me if I can help them with international shipments. That's how I kind of get into the international shipping uh, business. And then we started Forsket and then my sister joined me. That's how we had the, this uh, crazy growth actually last three years. Yeah, that's wild. Why Why 2020? Why was that the time to start? Was it because you're noticing, hey, everyone's having issues, there's got to be an opportunity here? Or, or was there something else kind of behind that timing? Actually, it was like actually kind of beginning of 2020, 2019. And we we had this idea with the Amazon sellers, okay, like why people don't know where their products are. Like, you know, they don't know when the product's going to check in. You know, back then, uh, you know, supply chain and international logistics was not this crazy. It was not middle of the entire conversations. Now, especially today, you know, we're going to talk about the FBA fees and other details, but profitability is one of the most important thing. Sustainability, you know, if you're not profitable in the past, you could lose money, but you could get like really cheap money to support that business and help the growth. But now because, you know, the, the money is very expensive, interest rates are very high. It's very hard to get 
line of credit or you cannot really find funding sourcing we see that with the aggregators you know <clears throat> so most of them like file in bankruptcy unfortunately and it was a good time for us to like tell people with the covid time hey look you need to track your shipments you need to have the control on your supply chain you need to have control on your lending fees because with the pandemic everybody was selling a lot of products but nobody really cared about their cost because the profit was high the de demand was there but now today since the demand is really low everybody start worrying about what happens with their cash flow what happens with their profit what happens with the turnaround time which went from three to four months to seven eight months so that hurt a lot of businesses unfortunately a lot of small e-commerce and amazon sellers had to exit the business not successfully um, so now the game is all about becoming brand and selling in omni channels, like different marketplaces, start your own website, like Shopify, Walmart, besides Amazon, or if you're strong in Amazon, using that leverage to expand globally. And Amazon makes that very, uh, reachable, very doable for, for sellers. Yeah. hundred percent. So uh, I was just going to touch on too. Like, I remember it. I think it was in 2020 ish. I was still living in Southern California. And so I would drive by the Long Beach, um, Harbor, you know, fairly often. And I remember watching as like you would see this line of cargo ships just waiting because they would also, they were having strikes and like issues with all of the other stuff. So yeah, it was a crazy time, but lot to unpack in what you just said. Um, love, love your background and story. I think kind of the first thing, let's, let's just dive into it, but. This is kind of the hot topic right now. So the fee changes, um, you know, to be honest, I haven't even dug into these a lot. And so I'm hoping to also be here to learn from you. I've seen the headlines, but to be honest, I see headlines about fees going up on Amazon every year. So what's different about the, the fee changes that have just happened? Um, you know, it's most likely like bad news for most of the sellers. I don't want to say negative things, but like right now i think we are living in the world like every single business trying to survive include amazon there is a huge competition approaching like you know we talk about like TikTok. we're talking about timu there's some like really cheap uh marketplaces they're trying to take over amazon's spot walmart.com is extremely <clears throat> active in the events extremely uh active in the you know offering people uh companies like cheaper uh, fees if you know they have like giving back them credits like ppc is much cheaper obviously demand is also lower on those marketplaces but they're trying to gain the correct brands and amazon had the problem of having too many brands maybe like they, they had a problem with cheap products unquality products you know most of us like even regular people who buy my friends you know they don't sell on Amazon. They know nothing about Amazon. They don't trust the reviews anymore. They know that it's fake, you know? So I think Amazon has lost a little bit of, uh, this, uh, the perfect customer service type of, uh, being a marketplace. Uh, they're trying to gain that back. They're trying to make sure that, you know, uh, they're offering good product. They're like delivering the good product. So they don't want people, you know, don't understand the business. So if beef is changing, affecting a lot, uh, especially companies with two things. Number one, they're bringing low inventory level, which I think that's going to be the, one of the biggest problem. It sucks because last year today, if you were selling uh, 500 cocktail shakers and because Amazon increased the FP fees a lot in 2023, you start working with a 3PL, a warehouse that you could keep most of your inventory and ship it to Amazon partially, small quantities, and Amazon will check them in, distribute it, so they becoming more like a fulfillment center. But then now they're charging you for a product that you don't keep in the Amazon uh, marketplace, like FBA. It's, it's I think it's like it's very crazy because uh, basically you need to keep an average of product uh, that you used to sell. So basically, you need to, if you if you ship to Amazon, they're gonna charge you. If you don't ship to Amazon, they still gonna charge you. So what's the sweet point? Um, I think it's going to be very difficult for sellers to understand these break evens uh, because eventually, you know, Amazon just like taking money out of your account. I think everybody needs to really look into their business reports very carefully to see what are the charges. And if they don't understand, like, you know, they need to open cases with Amazon to get these fees back. And the second thing is the full FC transfers. Like if you are shipping everything one 
fulfillment center, you know, Amazon distributes to more than 30, 40 locations, they're going to start charging you. So basically Amazon is encouraging you to ship to multiple locations. And I understand that because, you know, shipping domestically in the United States is very expensive. You know, you know, the truck fees, the gas, oil, spare parts, all the fees are going up. So Amazon has a lot of costs. So they're like, why not share with the sellers? Because they can't reflect this prices to the buyers because buyers already uh, have low buying power. So everything is kind of uh, related and connected. So these are the two things that people should be uh, paying attention the most. Yeah, those are both pretty wild. I mean, just from my time in the, the Amazon space, I feel like they, every year you get the emails about the fee changes and they always have a couple like that are getting going up and normally wrap it with like, oh, but we're also doing this one fee, like uh, the small and light fee, you know, or, or discount is going to be even better than ever. Um, these ones seem really significant though. I mean, I, never before have they had the, hey, we're going to charge you if you're not keeping your products in stock. And I personally haven't dug into that, but I'm wondering, you know, in the past, I've had plenty of experiences working with IPI scores and the storage limitations and all that stuff. And also the numbers that Amazon recommends you ship in to stay in stock, which I have not really been the best from my experience. So th that's definitely a worrisome piece. An interesting thing is in the past, they would tell you, okay, significantly the increase, 10%, 15%, very transparent. It's very easy to understand. The problem now is people don't know really like what does that mean? Like if I sh they they create an algorithm, if you sell 500 units, if you ship 300 units, you're not going to have 200 units according to Amazon. What will be the charging point? Like are they going to charge you per cubic feet that you're missing? Are they charging you the lost sales, which you are not actually, you're, you're not out of inventory. You know what I mean? So that's the tricky part. Actually, like one day you're going to wake up, you're expecting to receive $10,000 from Amazon. They're like, boom, they're, they're sending you $6,000. You're like, why? You know, it's people really need to understand their numbers. I think that's going to really stink. That's got to be really scary as well. If I'm just thinking of like, uh, you know, seas very seasonal products, right? Like uh, Halloween costumes, for example, those are going to have what, like a two month spike and then they're going to be drop off a cliff. So how is it? Is Amazon going to be really good about that? I, I would, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That, that's scary. So are you guys starting to kind of dig into that and, and work with your clients on those pieces? Yes. Like, so, so we have a client, 80% of their business is Christmas stuff like i have i have no idea like i even didn't think about that that's a very interesting point like what they're gonna do right because they're selling only like two months a year like you know right i know like it's just uh i don't know i think in some point small sellers you know uh they're gonna have the biggest hit because it's gonna hurt their cash flow a lot um because i know that so many companies they're having problems to pay their suppliers, their vendors, you know, their freight forwarders, 3PLs, they're like, oh, I'm waiting a payment from Amazon. I'm waiting for a payment from Amazon. But like when it's going to actually arrive and is it the same amount that you're expecting? Uh, this this problem is going to get deeper and deeper. I'm hoping Amazon like is aware of that. But same time, I think what they're thinking is because with the spike of this e-commerce uh, period, like 2020, 2021, uh, they thought that, you know, everything's going to be the same. Probably they opened up more than hundred new fulfillment centers. Now nobody's shipping to them. They're like, oh, we have all these fulfillment centers, but we, what are we going to do about this? Now they're even becoming more loosened up about the third party drop shipping. Like, you know, in the past they really didn't like that. But now since they have all the facilities, all these investments, they're like, okay, you know what? We can also do drop shipping. So I think. Every day, the business model changing. There's like, uh, there are more threats for Amazon, especially, uh, you know, some of the big players like Timu in the cheap product category, apparels, you know, shoes. Another news on the FBA changes, Amazon is reducing the rate for apparels, FBA fees. They're reducing the FBA fees below $20 product. It's a pretty significant drop when I was looking. Yeah, you can easily see that Amazon is observing what the competitors are doing, you know, like because Timu is very cheap, like other, so they're losing, they're losing uh, money on those business. Sellers don't want to sell on Amazon anymore. People are not ordering those things from Amazon because if you are not prime member that you're paying like six, $7 for domestic shipments in the United States, like who, who wants to do that? 
versus you can buy a jumper for you know eight dollars, twelve dollars, and you wait for I don't know two weeks, which is okay for people because prime delivery also takes three to four days. Another big hit is if you're selling like shoes or apparel, you get a high return rate fee, which is gonna kill the businesses in Amazon. I think maybe in some point Amazon will be like, We're not gonna which is kind of insane because that category is high returns. Like that's just how that category is. Yeah, that that makes it like I, I personally sometimes not sure if medium or large is gonna fit me. And a lot of people tell me in the real life, hey, Brock, you look taller than the, you look on the screen. I'm like, yeah, I know that. I'm 6'3", six, six, <laughs> if you guys want to yeah. know. <laughs> um, but, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure it's the safe for you, Bally. Sometimes you're not sure if it's going to fit medium or large. You order both and then you're like, okay, I keep this one. I return it. And right. so that's going to hurt businesses a lot. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, 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 it's going to be like really tough, you know. So I, I think like kind of just a follow up question and I can share my my input as well. But like, I guess from all the conversations you're starting to have or having with with clients, you know, are you seeing more and more of a shift for them to start selling on more and more of these other pl uh, platforms? And I know that I've had a lot of those conversations from people that I've talked to. However, I think a lot of them end up being, hey, we want to maybe start selling on Walmart, but eh, the demand's still not really ca catching up. And it's still kind of like... You know, is it really worth it to go on to those other places? But they're getting that downward pressure from Amazon with the fee changes and everything else. So I guess turning that question just to you, like, when do you think it's worth it to kind of expand to other platforms if you haven't already? Other marketplaces? I really think that if you're selling on Amazon, definitely start with Canada, UK. Uh, it's very easy. We we help sellers to register a company free of charge, and it's very simple because your listings will be transferred basically it's english your reviews your ratings if you're selling good product it's just like additional uh, revenue and amazon also allowing you to uh, meet their people now you know they do a lot of different events unbox accelerate you can go and meet amazon people get special offers get an account managers you know two years ago you were not able to like talk to anyone from amazon now you can sit face to face you're like oh they, these are real people not robots are running actually amazon it's actually a funny thing because you know uh, otherwise, you would have to speak to someone five days to wait, like, to get an answer. And uh, probably the answer you get is like, oh, sorry, what do you mean? You know? And so now it changed. I think starting point is depending on type of the product. Um, I personally support people to create their own website, like Shopify. Start building out your own email marketing. Start building out your <clears throat> own community. Start building out maybe a YouTube channel, you know, start building out. Uh, YouTube channel with your customers. Eventually, it's going to be your own brand. Eventually, no one can take it down. Another risk with Amazon is like one day you wake up, your listing is hijacked. Like, you know, you can't do anything. That will never happen in your website. And if you're selling, if you're patient about like a gardening product, gardening tool or like, a, or I don't know, kitchen, kitchen equipment, if you like to sell uh, cooking books, you know, you could make something very interesting. And then if people like it, now we live in the world, people like to shop more customized, you know, not like a bulky stuff. Maybe that's why Amazon is losing a little bit uh, customers because everybody thinks it's the same. Everybody might, if you go to nike.com, if you want to buy uh, training shoes, you can customize that. You know, you can choose your own colors. You know, not everybody wants to look the same. Um, so I think Shopify, your own website is a great tool uh, and it's going to start slow, yes, but eventually, you know, when you launch a new product, you have maybe 2,000 people you can email. And if they like it, they will just like order it, you know? So I think that's a really big thing. If you're selling like, I don't know, um, you know, daily stuff, food or uh, essential goods, walmart.com is a great place. Uh, but I think I'm a big fan of, I don't really know much about TikTok. I don't use it. I feel like I'm a little too old for that. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I know that people drive traffic through TikTok, conversion rate is not that high. Maybe people like it, they watch it on TikTok, but they don't go for the action. They don't buy it on Amazon. So I think it's really depending on the category. Some people are doing fitness equipments or fitness food. Those things are great for Instagram, TikTok probably. So it really depends on the product. But if you are selling a physical product, a little bit more traditional, I think setting up your own uh, website and having you know relationship with your uh, customers like buyers it's a great way to uh, do business right now I think eventually yeah. two years later today you can look at it 
Amazon might kill that product or that category because of the competition and pricing in your own website, you will have your own maybe happy small customer group that it will keep supporting you, you know? Sure. And yeah, you own the customer, right? Versus Amazon might have the benefit of like giving you the customer base and the exposure, but ultimately it's still Amazon's customer versus your website. You're going to own it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So Brooke, I know you mentioned, uh, mentioned as well, drop shipping kind of coming back into the scene a little bit. I know last year I talked to a lot of, ex, I would say ex drop shippers, a lot of them having issues with their Amazon accounts and you know, I know that that's been the trend. Is it Amazon pushing you, pushing everyone to say, "Hey, do not drop ship," or you have to do it in a very particular way? What's been kind of your take on that changing? I think it's about Amazon. Also, Amazon is very smart. You know, they they predict what is going to happen in the market because when they increase the, I'm sure you know, when they increase the uh, FBA rates, they know the result. They know what's going to happen, and that's okay. They kind of actually want to brush off. The cheap brands, they want to brush off like individual sellers that are not that serious. They receive a lot of returns. I mean, I mean, oh my God, I've been to a, a, a fulfillment center. You see trucks of return packages are like, they have even don't know what to do. Like they're ripped off, like broken. They need to like sort it out, like ship it. It's a lot of work. Labor is very expensive. It's very hard to find quality label. That's the problem with Amazon. So, you know, all these kind of things are creating problems to Amazon. Amazon thinks that if they don't stop this, it's going to hurt their business. So I think that's the reason why they're like, let's increase the sure return return fee, you know, and then maybe that seller is going to make it more clear for their buyers to, you know, have a better sizing measurement. Maybe they will add the AI. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't think Amazon just woke up one day, they're like, you know, um, uh, general managers, like CEOs, they're like, okay, I want to come up with like this new, it's been a problem like years, but now they're eating the margins a lot and it's just very, very expensive. So I think Amazon aware of the competition. And I think in some point, Amazon is going to leave that piece of cake to those companies and they're going to kind of target for a different niche, different type of customers. Maybe yeah. not, you know, the everybody, making $150,000 up to $25,000 a year. But maybe they will be like, we're going to be like focusing on 40,000 plus uh, annual income uh, customer target. That's why they're giving a lot of analytics uh, in their website. Now they have this new uh, menu in the dashboard. I can't remember exactly the name, but it's about some new analytics, like consumer behaviors. You know, they had like a brand analytics, but now they have something even else. Yeah. Yeah, they've definitely given access to uh, sellers on a, a lot more data points, which has been interesting. Just to follow up on that too, and on the in your world too, because you deal with all the logistics and all that stuff. Do you still see that you know with this new fee charge for the the low inventory thing? Do you still see FBM having like a, either an FBM backup skew or doing any FBM or seller fulfilled prime? Like where does that fit into this equation now? I, I don't know if you have a take on that, but I think it's an interesting discussion. I think uh, last one year, it's been a conversation within our customer database. Uh, we are doing a lot of FBA, FBM for especially oversized items like furnitures and small, these kind of items. Uh, large items, FBA fees are like too long, too too big and too high. One of our customers, they're selling like a bamboo laundry basket. It's, it's a big product. Um, it is heavy product. So they're like, FBA fees are maybe like almost $30. Then when we do FBA, FBM, like it's like up to 18 to $20. So we'll be looking into that more. But I think everybody needs to do some test runs and see what works, what don't work for them. And then that's where people should be going from. Um, eventually, this price is going to reflect to the consumers. I think, you know, the inflation is kind of like looking better in the United States. It's even we're expecting to go lower. Um, but I think the effect, this buying power is going to still be low like next year. So I think a lot of sellers need to be careful about their like cash flows and, you know, how they're running their numbers. So do you have any tips, I guess, for, for sellers maybe listening about how they can, at least on kind of the shipping and logistics side, maybe keep costs lower or just some like, I don't know if you have any simple or effective kind of places for people to, to look or what are the common areas they overlook maybe that they can dig into? I, 
I, th I think one thing one thing we've been we've been talking about their import fees. You know the what HTS code they're using. Uh, we offer free HTS code audit. Basically, uh, if you're ordering, if you're importing Bamboo um, Shelf Organizer, then <clears throat> there could be two or three different HTS codes with the different tariffs and different duty rates. So one of them could be 3.3%, another 7.5%, another is 25%. So eventually, if you're ordering $100,000 quarter product, it could be $3,000 you're paying tax, $7,500 or $25,000. This is one thing that you should be looking Another thing is the cash flow. I think they should be negotiating with their supplier for a better payment term, you know, not pay upfront. You know, a lot of freight, a lot of factories in China all around the world, they're having this kind of issues like cash flow. So the tip will be like, look at your lending cost. Number two, start analyzing your business reports on Amazon. And the third thing is negotiate price and payment term with your suppliers. Uh, these are the three things that people should, people should be focused on. Yeah. Yeah. Great framework. Uh, I guess, what's the future look like? I mean, you kind of said what next year is starting to shape up to, but what, what, what do you think the outlook is here on the, maybe the next 12 to 24 months? I wish, let me, let me take out my crystal ball and tell you the, the history, the, the, the future also. Um, you know, I'm like looking at the Bloomberg, Bloomberg right now. They're like talking about the Fed rates and stuff. For e-commerce sellers, I think they should be focusing on increasing their revenue. Uh, that's why adding at least one or two marketplace, at least one marketplace in a different part of the world, global selling isn't getting easier, uh, increasing the revenue. So this way, you know, they can focus on some profitable marketplaces. Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing is, I think, the inventory management. It's, it's going to be very crucial for next two years. Mm -hmm. And if people can manage their inventory correctly, that's all... They should be looking at like, you know, working with the digital freight forwarders like Forcecat, or they should be, uh, you know, putting their numbers in the correct Excel sheets, like, you know, uh, to see what does it end, end, up, end up and how much money they're receiving. And I think they should be like spending less money than they're making. Uh, I think this next two years going to be maximizing, I don't know, instead of adding new products, I think people should be focusing on maximizing for the existing product because we have some clients they're selling like 15 15 SKUs and then seven of them are not performing well and then they don't really pay attention to that too much in our warehouse in our uh, warehouse management system we send them an email and hey, look you have aged inventory oh another thing amazon is charging fp fees like aged inventory they're increasing the fee amazon don't want products sitting in their warehouse so same thing people should be really focusing on what products are aged as an inventory, what products are fast moving. Focus on the fast moving. It's not if it is not selling, just exit, liquidate, move on. Like we have some customers, they love their products. I'm like, yes, you love your product, but your customers don't love your product. Or Amazon algorithm don't love your product. So stop wasting your time and money on a not working products. Or if it is working, like get it done. Otherwise you'll be spending so much money. Yeah. Good tips. Barack, I want to move into kind of our next section here. My question I ask every guest is uh, does pineapple belong on pizza? What's your take? Oh man, I yeah, like I, I, I think I'm depending on like my mood. I think, uh, I think I would be like say no. Generally, okay. I'm more like a traditional like you know, you know, beef pepperoni, onions, olives, those kind of stuff. So that's a very neutral, neutral to no answer. Well done. Well done. All right. The reason I'm asking is this is kind of our, our controversial take part of the, the show here. So I like to ask every guest, you know, what is maybe one debatable or controversial thing that you believe that maybe others in the industry might not share the same opinion on? Do you have anything to give us? Uh, I think I think it's going to be the FBA fees. Like that's something we should because some of the fees going to apply from first of April, some of them is going to ap apply from June 1st. So Amazon is going to kind of giving people like some time to like consider what's coming next. Um, I think people should go to the, the FBA change fee. They have Amazon puts their FBA calculators, uh, like all the predictions So people should come up with the scenarios and they should like start getting prepared for that. Obviously, everybody's excited for the, uh, the last two weeks sales, but then from January, I think people should be like, go, go, go with the um, cost calculation. Yeah, 100%. Don't wait till, till it's too late. 
it's definitely seems like this is something you want to get ahead of. So that's awesome. Brock, is there anything I haven't asked you that you think I should ask you or that you uh, you wish I had asked you? Or did we cover all the important stuff? I, I think we covered everything. Uh, Chinese New Year is coming uh, this year, February 10th. So if you haven't placed your order, rest of the year you should. And, you know, factories will stop working, I would say, like end of January. And if you haven't uh, signed up to my YouTube channel yet, uh, please do that. Every week I'm post, I'm, I'm coming out with like new content about FBA fees, sourcing, shipping, fulfillment, supply chain. There will be like more content. Hopefully you don't mind me to do like a free advertisement right now. Of course now. not. This is your this is your time. I mean, is that the best way that people can get in touch with you or um, go for it? Stage is yours. All right, perfect. You can find us at uh, sales at forsket.com. And uh, if you guys want like free HTS code audit or um, anything related to international shipping or fulfillment, feel free to uh, find us online, forsket.com. Thank you so much, Ben, for having me. Awesome. No, that's great. Thanks so much. So that's going to bring us to the end of the show. Uh, everything that Barack mentioned, we'll put in the show notes or YouTube description so you can find that easily. Um, but Barack, thanks so much. Appreciate it. We'll have to have you back and to all the listeners. Uh, we'll be back again next week with some more amazing strategies and tips. Thank you so much for having me, man. Bye. All right. That brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks again to Barack from Forsket for joining us today. We hope you got some kind of insight or strategy. I know that I did. There are lots to think about, lots to unpack from that episode. As always, thanks for tuning in to the Amazon Strategy Show. We really appreciate you being here and spending time with us. If you did find some value in today's discussion, kindly ask you, leave us a rating, leave us a review, drop a comment. All that stuff does help us reach more people and also improve the show and make it better. Um, don't forget, of course, to follow us on our social media pages. We'll put links to everything, including those social media profiles down below in the show notes, the description, wherever you're watching or listening as well. Uh, that's it for today's episode. Be sure to mark your calendars. Join us again. We're going to be back next week for another captivating discussion. We've got some other guests lined up with some other amazing tactics and strategies coming to you. So until then, I'm your host, Ben Smith, signing off and wishing you happy selling.